Hi friends, welcome back to my channel. My name is Aina and I am an oncology pharmacist. Now Red is known as the mad chemist on YouTube for making videos like turning plastic into candy or making purple gold. But I didn't know he actually had his own pharmaceutical company because some of the videos that he made are about making medications. So today I wanted to watch these videos and share my reactions as a pharmacist with you guys. So the first one is called turning batteries into medicine. So in battery, there's lithium. I'm guessing that he's trying to make the drug called lithium that's used in treating bipolar disorder. Let's see. Bipolar disorder is a mental condition that is characterized by unusual changes in mood. Yes, we guessed it right. <laughs> Someone who suffers from it will have periods where they feel overly excited, happy, and energized, followed by periods of depression. The energized period is referred to as mania, so bipolar disorder is also called manic depression. So when we study bipolar disorder in school, there's a really nice graph to show visually what this means. Uh, in the middle is where neutral state is, and someone with bipolar will fluctuate between having really high mood to really low mood. Bipolar disorder is treatable through a combination of therapy and medication. It's typically treated using three main classes of drugs, mood stabilizers, antipsychotics, and anticonvulsants. It can sometimes be controlled with just a single mood stabilizer, but it often requires a combination of drugs. Right, so the treatment guideline for bipolar disorder is a little bit more complicated and it kind of depends on the initial presentation of the patient. If the patient presents with acute mania, then we would right away start them with a medication to treat mania. Usually the first choice is lithium, but if they present with severe depression, then the first line of treatment we would use is a antidepressant or an antipsychotic. Today I'll be making lithium carbonate, which is commonly used to treat bipolar disorder. To this day, lithium carbonate is one of the most effective and most commonly prescribed mood stabilizer used to treat bipolar disorder. However, new and more effective drugs are slowly being developed. Once lithium is ingested, it spreads throughout the central nervous system and affects a whole bunch of different processes. However, it's still not known exactly how lithium works to treat the disorder. Right, so again, he's right. Uh, we still don't really know how lithium works in the body. There are thoughts that maybe it affects the serotonin or norepinephrine uptake. Maybe it affects the cation transport across cell membranes or maybe some other pathways, but we don't really fully understand it. Unfortunately though, this drug has a lot of side effects because like Nigel said, this drug works on the central nervous system. It can also cause side effects like feeling drowsy, uh, feeling lethargic, which means feeling tired, feeling sedated. There are some more severe and long-term side effects as well, such as lithium toxicity. Um, and over time, it can actually damage the kidney or the thyroid gland. So as I said earlier, I'm gonna be making lithium carbonate. The route to lithium carbonate is quite easy and it starts with lithium metal. The lithium metal is first reacted with water to produce lithium hydroxide and then carbon dioxide is pumped through the water to make lithium carbonate. The lithium metal can be extracted from batteries, but it's really not cost effective. Yeah, I can imagine because in Canada, lithium pills are actually not that expensive. I think a month's supply is maybe maximum $20, $30. You can tell that Nigel is a real chemist because he calls the drug lithium by its actual chemical name with the salt, lithium carbonate. But actually as pharmacists and doctors, we usually just call the drug name by the first bit, so we would just call it lithium without caring about the salt. Okay, now for the second and more exciting part, where I make the lithium carbonate starting with a battery. Let me just preface this by saying that this method is not only a lot more expensive, but a lot more dangerous. How much would a pack of energizers cost? I think where I live, that will cost at least 10 to $20, depending on where you buy them. But I mean, a month of lithium pills might cost only 20 to $30. So unless he can produce a whole month of lithium from that pack of battery, it's definitely not cost effective. There's a few ways to do this, and all of them are a pretty big pain. I personally found that using a pipe cutter like this was the easiest method. Brand new pipe cutters seem to do a pretty good job, but the one I'm using is kind of old and dull. It eventually cuts through the casing, and we can pull it apart. Unfortunately, the one I'm using is kind of dull, 
and it pushed some of the casing into the lithium. Not only is this dangerous and can cause a short, but it also makes it a huge pain to get out. Yeah, he's not kidding when he says this is dangerous because I've never opened a battery up before and I've never seen anyone do it. So I don't even know what the inside of a battery looks like. If the battery does short out, it's going to heat up and although unlikely, it could burst into flames. Using a small clipper, I peel away a lot of the casing and I can pull everything out. Wow. It's then unrolled and the lithium okay. foil is separated from the other part of the battery. Okay, I did not know that the lithium inside comes in a foil like that. I don't know what I imagined in my mind, maybe some sort of powder, but I definitely did not know it's just metal rolled up together. Small pieces can be broken off and thrown into the beaker on the left, which has around 40 milliliters of water in it. It's really important to add the lithium slowly, because if too much is added at one time, it can burst into flames and literally explode. Flaming lithium will be shot everywhere, and it can lead to a massive fire. Even oh, though lithium God. is the least reactive of the alkali metals, it should still be treated with respect and used with caution. Okay, maybe it's the fact that this is an older video and he's doing this just on the counter, but I think in newer videos, if he attempts something this dangerous, he'll usually do that inside a hood. So at least if it explodes or catches on fire, it doesn't go everywhere. Even if it's added in small portions, it can still light on fire. No At way. least it doesn't explode though. Oh my God. On the left, I combined all of my lithium carbonate and on the right, I weighed out about 300 milligrams. 300 milligrams is the typical dose of lithium carbonate and it's taken three or four times a day. So the usual dosage for this drug is up to 900 milligrams a day in two to three divided doses. It's taken as a pill, but- Oh, no way. He's going to make them into a capsule. But like with most drugs, it's not just packed into a pill capsule and taken pure. Additives that are included with the pill are known as excipients. Although the excipients are commonly known as just fillers, they do have a purpose. Depending on what's included, it can change the properties of the pill, and I've listed some of the mm -hmm. major ways here. Mm -hmm. So in pharmacy, we would call the lithium carbonate the active ingredient, and we would call everything else the non-active ingredients. And weirdly enough, a lot of the patients who have allergies to certain drugs are not actually allergic to the active ingredient. They may be allergic to the non-active ingredients that are in the pills. So for example, for vegan patients who need to take capsules, a lot of the times they need to ask us if the capsules contain any animal products because what? I didn't know this before I worked in pharmacy, but capsules contain what? gelatin and gelatin actually come from animal products. So if the patient needs, we may need to source plant-based capsules to compound some drugs for the patient. Once it was all mixed together, I very sloppily packed it into a pill. Oh God. I snapped on the oh. other end, and I now have the first finished product of Nile Red Pharmaceuticals. <laughs> all jokes aside, this is a really low quality product with dirty lithium carbonate in it, and nobody should ever even think of ingesting this. That's funny that he said that because I'm pretty sure in other videos he's tasted or eaten whatever he's made. Okay, let's watch this one, extracting lidocaine. Lidocaine is a pretty potent local anesthetic that has a lot of different applications. The most familiar use is probably the use by the dentist to numb your teeth. It's also used in other things like creams and topical ointments for minor pain relief. In cancer pain management, actually, you can actually administer lidocaine as an IV infusion for severe pain patients. And it's usually given for those with neuropathic pain because lidocaine works on the sodium channel blockers in nerve cells. And the dose for this is really high. It's about five to 10 milligram per kilogram given IV over 60 to 120 minutes. This is the best product for extracting lidocaine because it has the highest concentration of 5% and it has no emulsifiers or surfactants. Okay, I know you guys probably find this funny. I personally haven't had to recommend anal lubricants, but I've recommended many women with lubricants to help with vaginal dryness, 
menopause symptoms or painful intercourse. And I'd have to be professional because sexual health is something pharmacists get asked quite a lot. We then open up the brand new, never before used bottle of lube and pour it into a beaker. I mean, it's important that he mentions that because we're talking about making pharmaceutical products here, right? So if the bottle has been opened, it could have been exposed to air, which has other contaminants in there. And also with an open bottle, you don't know if the expiry lasts as long as the bottle says, right? So, you know, he's just making sure we understand he's using brand new products so that his lidocaine has the best quality. You can see it's pretty goopy, so I squeeze the bottle and I do my best to get out as much as possible. Also, can I just say, this is a rather large bottle of lubricant. Um, the ones that I usually see around pharmacies are usually a lot smaller than this. So at this point, we can start to add the sodium hydroxide solution that we made earlier. You can see that the moment that it's added, a white Ooh. precipitate crashes out, and this is our lidocaine. Oh, that looks so cool. That looks like one of those gooey lamps with stuff floating inside. As I kept stirring, things were dissolving well, but you'll notice this black clump that's floating around. What is that? I'm honestly not really sure what this is, but it's definitely oh. not lidocaine. What? Don't tell me that came from that bottle of lube. I haven't had to do chemistry experiments in a really long time. The last time I did them was in undergrad chemistry classes. But man, that seems like a rather large impurity. I laid out the lidocaine and I just let it dry overnight in air. In the morning, I was left with some pretty dry lidocaine and when I weighed it, it came out to be about 6.5 grams. Unfortunately, I didn't weigh the lube before I used it, so I don't know what the theoretical yield is. Anyway, 6.5 grams is more than enough for me. Most of the time, we don't see drugs in their original powder form, but lidocaine is one of the drugs that I have seen in its powder form. That's because a lot of the times we have to use lidocaine to compound it with another cream. For example, if the doctor wants to prescribe someone with a pain cream, but also with a little bit of menthol in there to produce that cooling effect, they'll write a prescription for pharmacies to compound, uh, let's say, Cetaphil cream, but add menthol and lidocaine in there. We would take crystallized forms of menthol and powder form of lidocaine and we would mix that up together with a cetaphil cream and we would sell that to the patient. Ooh, this one is interesting, turning aspirin into Tylenol. Both of these are very inexpensive drugs. It would be cool if he can do something like turning a really cheap drug into a really expensive drug. Tylenol is probably known as acetaminophen or paracetamol. The brand aspirin seems to be pretty universal around the world but it might also be known as ASA. I live in Canada and we call Tylenol acetaminophen, but I swear I've heard many other patients from other countries, they don't know what acetaminophen is because they call it paracetamol. Let me know what is your name for Tylenol. And yeah, I would say aspirin is such a global name. So in Chinese, we call aspirin acetylene. And I don't even think people know the chemical name of aspirin, which is acetyl salicylic acid or ASA. We just always call it by the brand name. I mean, that's how you know the drug companies came up with a successful brand name. I made a video previously talking about pharmaceutical companies and coming up with names. So if you're interested, you can check that out later. The first step was to extract the actual aspirin from the pills, which is chemically known as acetyl salicylic acid, or ASA for short. You can tell that Nigel is Canadian because the drug packaging has both English and French. In total, I used 200 pills, which only contained 100 grams of aspirin. The rest of the stuff in there is just a bunch of filler junk. So I'm looking up the fillers in aspirin. It contains stuff like cornstarch, powdered cellulose, uh, red and blue dye, titanium dioxide. Yeah, seems like pretty standard stuff. It does have that really nice pink Bayer logo stamped on the outside. And I'm glad he bought the extra strength aspirin, which are the 500 milligram tablets. If he had bought baby aspirin, which are either 80 or 81 milligrams, depending on which country you live in, he would need a lot more tablets than this. In the flask, some of the aspirin started to precipitate, as the acetone cooled down. That's a pretty color. With just a little bit of mixing though, everything goes back into solution. I'm totally not sure about this, but did the pink color come from the pink stamp of the Bayer logo on the tablets? Aspirin's chemically known as acetyl salicylic acid, 
and under these hot acidic conditions, it's broken apart to form salicylic acid and acetic acid. So salicylic acid is actually the active metabolite in the human body. So that is really interesting because he basically is mimicking what the body does to acetosalicylic acid to produce the active metabolite. But salicylic acid on its own is sold as another drug. It's used in a lot of dermatology products for acne. And this one can be also bought over the counter as well. A lot of the acne products that you see in pharmacies will contain salicylic acid. When I first made this video, I predicted that the final efficiency would be around 30%, but that was way too optimistic. You guys will see just how far off I was. He can make an acne cream actually with all the salicylic crystals lying here. Keeping this reaction cold was extremely important because I only wanted to add one nitro group. Yeah, so this definitely doesn't look pharmaceutically elegant yet. Uh, let's see what happens next. There are several ways to do this, but I decided to use the sodium borohydride and palladium on carbon method. It just seemed to be the cleanest and easiest. <laughs> Nigel isn't kidding when he says he would buy chemicals from eBay and they would be shipped from China. This is obviously a chemical that's from a Chinese chemical company. Uh, it says Guo Hua Shi Ji, which roughly translates to um, National Reagent Company, something like that. Though, and I had to take it out of the ice bath. Then, when it started to heat up again, I just added it back. It's starting to turn green. Moving around, I just filtered it off. Some of the carbon managed to make it through, though, so I filtered it again. Unfortunately, the whole now filtration process took quite a long time. Oh my goodness, how many color changes can we expect here? The final yield was 0.21 grams, which was less than the amount that would go into a single regular strength Tylenol tablet. Okay, 0.21 grams, that's 210 milligrams. Um, yeah, so the lowest dosage of an adult acetaminophen tablet is 325 milligrams. So this is maybe two-thirds of the dosage for a Tylenol tablet. So basically, I was able to convert 200 extra strength aspirins into one really weak <laughs> Tylenol. The percent yield of this step was oh, extremely low, at around 18%. <laughs> So I really enjoyed making this video. I thought it was so cool watching Now Red making drugs out of his own home lab. Please give this video a like if you enjoyed this as well and subscribe for more contents like this. And I'll see you in the next video. Bye!